Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, item 10, we have the Auckland Plan 2050 Annual Monitoring Report 2024. We've got Denise and Lise here. And I think Karen, no, Karen's not here. Kia ora. Oh, Karen's at the back. Karen. Kia ora to the both of you if you just want to um, introduce your roles and the presentation. Thank you. Kia ora everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Erickson in the Strategic Advice Unit um, and Research Unit. We are now. And Denise is here um, with me to help answer any questions you might have. Um, but I will t take us through, just briefly, through the Auckland Plan Annual Monitoring Report. Um, and just basically just the changes that we've done this year in terms of the measures and also just um, some very key takeaways in terms of what how the Auckland Plan is progressing. Um, this year we undertook a review of the performance measures um, to ensure they remain the most appropriate um, indicators of Auckland's progress. The review aimed to address issues around the completeness of the measures and also data availability, which has been a bit of a challenge for some measures in the past. Um, as a result of the review, changes were made across four of the Auckland Plan outcomes. Um, ten oh, previous Lisa, could, could you just move your microphone a little bit closer to you? Sorry. Just, yeah, just That's all right. thank you. Or my chair closer. Here we go. Um, Perfect. Ten pre, uh, previous measures or sub measures were retired or replaced, and 14 new measures um, have been, been introduced. In total, we now have 38 measures. Um, some measures are comprised of several sub-measures to give a more complete picture of things. For example, the housing affordability measure now contains three sub-measures, which, which gives us a much more nuanced picture of housing affordability. So how is the Auckland plan progressing overall? Well, relative to the baseline, which in most cases is 2018, uh, we see that 39% of our measures are progressing positively, which is good. Um, and 22, so almost a quarter, are tracking negatively, um, while um, almost a third of we are seeing no change since 2018, or no notable change. If we jump to um, just at a high level some of the good news and not so good news, um, there's been some positive progress in, with respect to housing supply and housing affordability. Um, the long-term picture is of improved housing supply, um, despite dwelling numbers or dwelling consent numbers falling in the past couple of years overall, we are up, and that's largely attributable to the upzoning enabled by the Auckland Unitary Plan. Um, this has increased housing supply, which in turn has slowed pressure or dampened um, house price growth. Um, and we're seeing that across all of our three housing affordability measures where the house price to income ratio has um, fallen and rental affordability has improved. And also we see that the housing cost overburden rate, which is the percentage of households that spend more than 30% of their household income on housing related costs has also fallen um, for renters, not, not for homeowners though. Um, so there is progress um, in that space, but not to forget that housing still remains severely unaffordable for a lot of Aucklanders that are struggling to afford decent housing, and that's also um, reflected in the numbers of, of people on the public housing register, which is at historically high levels. Um, in terms of the environmental measures, um, we've seen some good progress actually across those measures. And particularly in respect to management of native habitats and native species. Uh, more of our beaches are swimmable more of the time. Um, so there is some good um, progress to report in that space. In the transport space, um, overall, um, public transport patronage and biking is down um, from 2018, but we are seeing it recover and expecting that those numbers will be back to pre-COVID levels over the next couple of years. Um, there has been worsening in congestion over time, and the number of deaths on our transport ne network has come down, still too high, um, but it is um, tracking in the right direction, um, and there's been no notable change in serious injuries. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, they have come down overall compared to the baseline, but 
a lot of that is down to what happened during COVID and what we've seen is that from 20 to 2021, which is the most recent data we have, it did start to rebound and we're expecting that when we look at the data next year, that trajectory may well have continued, which is um, of concern. To put Auckland's transport emissions challenge into perspective, we also note in the report that Auckland's per capita transport emissions are three to four times higher than some other cities that are leading in the space, so Barcelona, even Sydney, uh, Copenhagen, Oslo, Amsterdam, those kind of places. So it gives a bit of a sense of the challenge we're facing. Looking at some of our economic indicators, there's been improvement in labour productivity and earnings over time, but in the past years, in the past year, earnings have fallen overall, although it's impacted different ethnic subgroups differently. So for European and Pacific peoples, it's kept increasing, but for Māori and Asian, it's down. Um, of particular concern, um, and in the, in the bad news column, I guess, is the falling educational achievement. Um, so less of our young people are achieving um, le a level four qualification and more young people are neat. Um, and likewise, there's been no change in the, no in the percentage of children in material hardship, both of which are, is of concern. Um, just another couple of things to note. Um, we have not been able to update any, well, a couple of measures we have, but Overall, we haven't been able to update the belong and participation measures due to the timing of the quality of life survey this year. Um, that's about to come out over the next month, so we'll kind of watch that space with interest. And just lastly, um, not in, we don't feel enough is known about Auckland's greening status. We know that nature in the city is really important for health and well-being and the importance to climate change mitigation and adaptation and we would have really liked to address that in the measures review and introduce a measure that captures that that we can look at annually to see how we're going but unfortunately um, we weren't able to kind of plug that gap but it's something that we um, are keeping a close eye on um, and there is good work happening in that space in terms of monitoring canopy coverage in different ways um, that should maybe be able to give us data that's more frequent that would be useful for this kind of annual reporting purpose. Um, and that's it um, from, our, from us. And um, any questions, we'll have a go at answering them. <laughs> cool, thank you. Thank you both once again in the teams. It's a huge body of uh, work to constantly report to us. Um, yeah, good to see some positive stuff, but also concerning, uh, as always, with the negative statistics there. Um, Member Henare. Kia ora, Chair. Um, thank you for the report. Can I take you to uh, uh, 51? And it says the report includes four measures on Māori identity and wellbeing. And while the reporting of this data has no impacts on Māori, continued monitoring is expected will limit myself to how do you write a report with that, that actually has stuff in it about Māori, um, but you don't uh, seek any input? from Māori. Um, thank you for the question. So when we were um, pulling together this report, we're using the um, measures that we use every year to, um, to report progress on the plan overall. And when we do that, we go back to the data sources that we have used. So we do a fairly analytical view of that. We, um, we go to those data sources and we report the data. We don't um, engage further on that data because we are reporting um, information which has been prepared through other data sources that we use to pull into the report. So that, that, uh, that data is from 2018. It's pretty old. That's and true. It's, it's given... given in the last couple of, uh, well, last month or so, um, census data has been released. So did that inform this report? Um, thank you for that question. So, so no, because the census data came out just after this report um, was completed, but we will go back to look at that data now to see what else it, it can tell us. The, um, the Tekapenga survey, which is the Stats New Zealand survey, which is carried out um, post-census, 
The last one was done in 2018, and some of the data that we look for comes from that, so it leaves a real gap for us. We don't know when that survey will be done again, but we understand it may not be for another few years. So that's something that we're really mindful of, that there's, there's a real gap. Uh, given, last one, given um, <clears throat> the some of the stuff in the report directly impacts on Māori communities, education, for example, um, will there be a, an engagement with the community uh, down the line somewhere? So thank you for that question. We, we prepare this report, um, which is then made available to um, staff and council who are doing their policy work and further development. And so that's evidence for them and, and the work that they do and an engagement that they have as part of those processes. Kia ora, um, Member Hinare. Uh, Deputy Chair, Councillor Dalton. Thanks, Chair. Just one question around the transport and the measurement against 2018, and uh, that's to do with transport usage. Do we use that measure as a point of interest rather than a point of success, given life has changed in terms of how we travel pre-COVID to post-COVID? So I wouldn't see a 2018 target I wouldn't see 2018 and necessarily being a target given that there's more people working from home and, um, yeah, lifestyles have changed. It's a question I've asked of Auckland Transport before because I thought of, I just thought it was strange that we were still trying to benchmark ourselves in that way. Uh, thank you for the question. Through the Chair, um, 2018 is, is, a, is a baseline and, and it's not the target. Um, I see what you Life has changed, so I think we need to maybe review those baselines um, within that context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Turner. Thank you. Um, with our urban Nahiri, and um, so all over the, the city, especially in the outer suburbs, we've got vegetation encroachment into the road corridor, causing problems for buses, larger vehicles, even, even smaller vehicles. Um, it's not just out there too, uh, even in the city itself. Um, Kinross Street in um, Blockhouse Bay, um, I had an email from Auckland Transport which said they couldn't consider um, Kinross Street as a, as a bus route because their policies say they have to be able to pull up to the curb at any point for emergency issues and they couldn't do that on Kinross Street because of the odia hanging branches from all the hutakawas up that street. Um, they couldn't get to the curb in, in every situation. So my, my question is how do we balance, well first of all my question is is our urban Nahiri being used to measure against our carbon targets? And, and also, how is our maintenance of the other road issues, the road user issues, balanced against our, our tree um, outcomes, our, our urban Nahiri outcomes that, here? I would have to go with that, thank you for the chair, but I actually don't know, so it was something I'll have to go away and talk to our parks people and transport people about, because it's getting down in some detail that I'm not across, sorry. Thank you, because um, I, I'd like that I'll email you, because um, you know I think it's important that all our decisions at this table mm -hmm. are linked to the practical outcomes on the ground. Thank you. Kia ora, Councillor, and I think we are due Councillor Dalton and I have been working with the Urban Ahiri team to have another update. So I've recently dealt with some tree planting part of the Urban Ahiri program where the team have explained how choices are made. We can't obviously deal with, you know, 60-year-old trees and why they're there, but about where we're planting and why and, and you know, sides of the road even. So we, we will um, be able to discuss that more in depth when that comes back. But good question. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, thanks. I've got a number of questions because I'm a little bit confused on um, the questions I'm going to ask about. 
there's the big attached report and you've got that kind of uh, dashboard which is access to transit stops 40 percent etc etc I'm, I'm going to ask about that um you've got on the side the good news around um public transport and cycling and yet in that report there's a big red arrow next to both of those measures um in terms of public transport boarding and cycle movements so i'm just i'm a bit confused is it a good news picture or a bad news picture yes thank you for the question um you picked up on a, a difficulty in how to report this because compared to, that's why I put in brackets there mostly it because for every one of these good news stories there's kind of a flip side to it so compared to the 2018 baseline things are not looking that great but what is good is that it's actually recovering because a lot of the reason why it was down is because of COVID but we have seen that things are actually recovering in the past you know in the past year that's reflected in the data. So it's that trying to balance looking at that five year, six year picture through from the baseline to what's happened in the last year. So it's safe to safe to say then that we haven't gotten back to the 2018 baseline figure. We're still below it. Okay. Um, and I, I sort of kind of already answered my question a little bit, but I'll just pose it um, in case you've got anything to kind of add. Um, as, are these PT figures, they're in absolute terms, right? They're not as part of the mode share. Right, so we're, we're counting people stepping on a bus as opposed to not taking into account population, all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. Um, I am wondering if there is a measure, because I haven't seen anything about it, if we're talking about house prices and rent prices, surely we would need to index those to the average income to get a good picture on whether they're up or down or affordable or not affordable. So is there anything you can kind of guide me on where we're going with that as a city? Thank you for that question. The housing affordability are um, not indexed to um, incomes per se, but they're calculated as a ratio of income. So both um, the first measure on um, housing affordability is a housing price to um, income ratio, and the rental affordability is also over income. So it is relative to income in that sense. So we, just on a broad level, is housing getting more or less affordable? It's becoming more affordable. Yeah, it has become more affordable. It's good. Yeah. It's good. And I, I, I'll talk, save this for the debate, but housing supply, I think, really is part of that picture. Yeah, but I'll absolutely. talk about that more. Um, okay, just moving on to the opportunity and prosperity section, because I'm a bit confused about those measures there. You've got Aucklanders average wages, um, 1360 and a big nice green arrow there. Is that taking into account inflation or is that a, a net figure or a net or gross figure? That's a real figure. That's inflation adjusted. That's inflation adjusted. Yep. That's cool. Um, awesome. And you've got level of unemployment 4.4 and you've got that as static. But on this slide it says rising unemployment. So what's the deal there? It's the same situation again where compared to the 2018 baseline it's more or less the same but it fluctuates over time. Um, and but in the last year, it's worsened. Um, but that brings it basically back in line with what it was in 2018. Yeah, but it is cyclical. This is my last one. Um, I could probably ask 20 more questions, but I'll save it. Um, my last one here is income distribution, and you've got the um, Guinea coefficient there, 35.5 um, and a green arrow. So are we getting more equal or less equal? We're getting more equal over time. Right. However, that data is only up until last year, so it doesn't take account of what has happened in the last year, ah. which may um, have impacted Just had number. much more unemployment yeah. and inflation Because issues. those earnings figures were able to get up to 2024, <coughs> but not the gain coefficient. Okay. Can't. Yeah. So it's safe to say we actually probably need more data to measure that properly, because that's not really accurate. It's still... <laughs> Yeah, it's still giving us a long-term picture from 18 to 23. It may have changed in the last year. Um, okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks, thank you. you. Uh, thanks, Councillor. And uh, yeah, I think this is also the, the hard thing of we measure June to June every year, but based on old data and yeah, it's always playing catch up, but it does show the long. Um, we do these yearly updates, but it can be confusing. Councillor Filipina. Kill the... Chair. Uh, thank you, ladies. 
Look, uh, this, this is not about this report, but my question really is to try and clear my head around the Auckland plan. Not 2050, but going back to the Auckland plan under the legislation of the Local Government Act 79 and 80. Now, I know that this got adopted in 2018. We had our plan in 2012. That then became 2018. And every six years, according to statute, we need to sort of have a look at um, another plan. So now that we're into 2024, is what you're reporting the updated around us and our oblig or obligations to the Local Government Act around spatial plan? Is, is this what we're getting now? Because I thought we would have a look at a review of the existing Auckland plan, which is 2050. That would then take into account what uh, Member Henare was talking about earlier around the statistics. So I'm just trying to get my head around where that is as per the legislation. Thanks, Councillor. And you'll be happy to note in pre-agenda, I told the staff you would ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> it puts me under pressure to have a good answer, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Filipiana. Um, so the Auckland plan, so as you know, we've sort of in a, been in a bit of uncertainty with the legislative change which has been going on and reform from government, both the previous government and the current government. So um, the Spatial Planning Act, so the Spatial Planning Act was introduced last year and, and that would have repealed the um, Section 79 and 80 of the Local Government Auckland Council Act. Um, but that, um, that act was then repealed at the end of the year. Um, so that um, reinstates those provisions. So we still have a requirement to do a spatial plan. It doesn't actually set a specific review requirement, um, but but you know, in, in general practice would have been to look at that every every six years. Um, so what we don't know now. So the current government has said that they are looking to introduce some spatial planning as part of their um, phase three of the RM reforms, um, likely to be in mid-2025 and in place by 2026. We don't know any detail of that yet. Um, it could possibly take a, um, a narrower focus than the current Auckland Council Act legislation, so focusing on urban development and infrastructure. In particular. So while that's still uncertain, while we've considered what some options might be for a review, um, we would, we'll, we're waiting to find out a little bit more about that and before we come back to you with what we would propose. Supplementary Chair, because we've already now into the sixth year, do you think we should be waiting for any legislative change for us to do what we need to do which is to look at a 30-year spatial. I know it's 2050, because things will change in the next term. I have no doubt at all. Our people around this table may change, or will change. But I'm trying to sort of look ahead and say, let's not wait for the statutory requirements or any repeals, mm. because no matter what happens, we'll be seven years into it, and there's an item coming up that started in 2012. Yeah, the, and we're 12 years uh, sort of behind trying to implement that. I don't want this to be in the same situation. So um, is there, that it may be directed to the chair, an opportunity for us to still look at it? We still need to, instead of waiting for mid-2025. You know, I mean, as Member Henare said, the Statistics, even with Māori population, Pacifica, ethnic population, the population in general. So yeah, I, I don't know where this is targeted to, but... Kia ora, Councillor. I think, and we mentioned this last year, um, I spoke to the Select Committee under the last government when this change came in, and our issue was it was like the legislation was sort of ignoring that Auckland has a different set of rules than the rest of the country. What they said at the time is they would require us to do a fully new spatial plan, which is essentially a new Auckland plan. So that legislation was in place last year. And so we we would have started the, the review, the six yearly, and the six years is our choice. It's not a legislative. So that was been, that we just chose six years or, or the previous council chose. But then what happened was, so the staff were working to a new piece of legislation. 
we couldn't do our own review and then that changed and now the new set of officials are telling our officials that there will be a new requirement. So the issue is if we jump into our own Auckland plan refresh, spend all that money and time and then once again, much like plan change 78, we're getting pulled you know, on these 180 um, whiplash events, huge amount of money. And so we're still just, you know, I guess we can't do our process until we know but also last year we couldn't have done our process legally. <laughs> Could I just also add um, through the chair that so in 20, so I guess the other slightly complicating factor is the um, future development strategy requirements and, and um, in 2022 to support the development of the future development strategy we did actually update the plan in terms of um, data and and um, new strategic direction which had which had been hadn't been incorporated so we have done a, a, an update to hasn't kind of stayed static we do update um, some of the data as we get that um, so it's it's not as out of date as as 2018. It, it is it's more current than that, but um, it's something we do need to consider within the context of what we'll be required to do around both the future development strategy and the broader spatial planning requirements that the government will be introduced. We just need to do it. I mean, I don't think we need to wait for any legislation. I mean, even if, yeah, it's just it's going to be seven, eight years and then, hello or sorry. So, yeah, it's a part of the issue, again, of national not national p political party, <laughs> central government um, laws requiring things of us and not treating Auckland differently and then expecting different expectations from us. I, I found, I've found this process not looking at us as an, as an exception pretty frustrating from both sides of the parliament. Um, Councillor Ferry? Kia ora, thanks. Um, yeah, I've been a bit concerned about that Auckland plan timing too, so I'm glad Alf asked about that. Thanks for the answers. Um, but uh, the reason I put my hand up was um, the PT usage. Um, so my understanding is that um, buses and ferries have actually both rebounded, that the outstanding issue is in trains, and of course that's been um, largely impacted by the rail network rebuild and, and other issues that we're having in the train space. So I guess I'm wondering how do we in a report like this potentially um, capture that nuance to say um, it's, you know, if we are looking at 18, 19 as Councillor Dalton raised as our sort of benchmark um, and we're sort of saying that's pre-COVID but actually the lag here is does not appear to be COVID related. It's the part of the network that's actually had other disruptions, and the parts that were that haven't had those disruptions seem to have rebounded from COVID. N noting the change in you know Mondays and Fridays, but the overall patronage numbers have have rebounded. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, in the details of the report, we do actually break the data down by modes. Um, and it does tell that story that actually some of that rail disruption has actually impacted these numbers quite, but it is expected to rebound um, as much of that work is wrapped up. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to make sure that was highlighted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The other measure we might need to use in the future is individuals using PT because AT say there's actually more people using them since pre-COVID, but fewer times a week. Um, Councillor Lee. Thank you. Just Can you just confirm um, the what was uh, called in the Local Government Auckland Council Amendment Act, the statutory, the spatial plan, the spatial plan for Auckland, which the Council adopted um, the name Auckland Plan, um, um, has been actually unmoored from the Local Government Act, I think, the section of the Local Government Act was repealed by the last government and then with the incoming government, um, the incoming government repealed the repeal and um, migrated the Auckland plan or the space, what they called a spatial strategy um, to RMA legislation, 
propose our image. Is, is that right? Um, thank you for the question. So the the Spatial Planning Act that was introduced under the previous government would have ultimately ended in the repeal of Section 79 and 80 of the Local Government Auckland Council Act once all spatial plans had been developed across the country. When that, um, when that Spatial Planning Act was then repealed at the end of last year, the, um, those provisions were reinstated into the Local Government Auckland Council Act. So they still remain until such time as new legislation is introduced and the government has said that it will introduce uh, spatial planning legislation as part of phase three of the resource management reforms, possibly next year. Status sort of on, on hold, as it were. Just just questions um, of what you refer to in the re report um, or presentation as measures. Um, it's, it's very hard to... Uh, obviously, there's data behind this, so it would be good to have a look at it. Um, a little bit confusing that you're talking about six outcomes to be achieved, outcomes and measures to be achieved, and I can only see, I can see seven uh, good news mostly, uh, and there is six not so good news, which when you read it, it's probably bad news, to, in fact. Um, but in terms of public transport use, usage, which is in the good news column, mostly, um, is recovering. Um, and yet, conversely, congestion has more, <laughs> has more than recovered. Um, it would be good to get some clear data on that. It, coming back to the main effort of this council in recent years, in terms of expenditure, even now, and more to come, is rail transport, and that's still 70, about 79% of what it was um, pre-COVID, um, but it's termed as recovering. Um, it's not a measure to say recovering. Um, cycle movements, they're recovering as well. Um, I think we just need a little bit more clarity to be fair to this council, a lot of the measures and outcomes are not our responsibility, but we've adopted them in what was originally a spatial plan. Um, so could we have some more detailed information on these measures or outcomes, please? And Mr Chair, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, the, the background of the spatial plan when it comes to discussion section of, of this th item. Thing. Kia ora, Councillor Lee. I'll just see if any of the questions you ask could be answered. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Um, we provide more detail in the appendix to the report on the actual data and the data, data sources, but if we can actually send you some specific data on Tell you for a while, I am interested in, in public transport in particular, and Auckland Transport has, which once was excellent in providing data um, to its directors on its d director's agenda, um, has become quite non-transparent on public transport and finances over the past year, 18 months or so. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Watson. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, just trying to uh, weigh up the good and the not so good with what you perceive as is happening on the ground uh, in and around Auckland, and I, and I think you've you've managed to capture it um, quite nicely here. So, so on the face of it, uh, it's something like housing affordability, which is pretty fundamental to people's lives, has improved. Um, um, we've got this falling house price to income ratio, but it's still severely unaffordable. So it's 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 not just unaffordable; it's severely uh, um, unaffordable. So I, I guess that kind of minor adjustment, if you like, you know, where a house of 1.3 million goes down to 1.25 or something, is pretty much academic as far as those people who, who aren't already in that market. And, and 
I just wondered, similarly with, with the rental, people in renting, um, um, uh, rental affordability uh, on, on the face of it has, has improved a little bit, but the rental people are the people who spend more than 30% of their income on housing for you know for, for, for a starter, so they're, you know, they're, they're worse off before you even begin the race. Um, and um, so I guess w with, with the whole housing situation then, it's really one of of a of some relatively minor improvements that, in the overall picture, will get trumped by these other um, kind of not so good developments elsewhere. Like, for instance, even the cost of transportation, which has gone up um, in that same period, so they've been cut out. So, I guess at the the end of that, and I know it's probably not your your brief, but. Um, you know, li living in Auckland, say 2024 compared to say 2019 or 2016, for people it's really got quite a bit harder, hasn't it? Really, that I mean, that's the big picture sort of conclusion at the end of everything. Thank you for the question <laughs> through the chair. Um, yeah, you've picked up obviously on the conundrum we're in that. We're reporting relative to a 2018 baseline, and over that time, housing affordability, for example, it has improved. It doesn't change the fact that lots of people are really struggling um, to get into the housing market or pay their weekly rent. Um, so, and as far as what's life like in Auckland, some of those things will come through in the uh, quality of life survey results that we're still waiting for and that we haven't been able to, um, the timing of that this year is different. Um, so we haven't been able to report on that. But one of the measures, for example, in there is about the quality of life that people are experiencing yeah. in Auckland. So, you know, we'll watch that space yeah. as that data comes out. Yeah. When are you expecting that data? In November, I think it is. Okay. Sorry, you were both speaking away from the microphone there a bit, so I missed, missed the end slightly, but um, Mayor Brown. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I've got two questions. One is, um, do we attempt to align the measures, I mean, you can measure everything, but do you attempt to align the measures up with what the measures are for CCOs, that we ask for CCOs, and vice versa? Do you give us some advice when, I, when we ask the CCO measures that they possibly should align with measures Overall, the CCOs do, after all, deliver about half of what we do. We'll at least use half the cash in here. Thank you for the question, um, through the Chair. The, the Auckland plan measures are very much these outcome level measures, where the CCOs report on more service level measures, I believe. So um, in that way, they're different. We Obviously, the transport measures are aligned with tra Auckland transport measures, because the um, they supply the data largely, um, so in that sense we do, um, but not across the whole all plan. Because um, be, given as what Councillor Lee said, we're not responsible for half the things we measure, but we are responsible for that group, and it would be nice to know how they're sort of contributing towards it. My second um, question was, or suggestion possibly, um, could we have a measure for happiness? Um, it seems like other people do that, how the people feel about things, and the other one is a measure for how good we are at stopping wasting money, which would be another useful one. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, haven't looked into that, at a, and I know, don't know how available it is at a city level. Um, I know it is at Nations, because um, my country of Denmark is apparently very happy. Um, <laughs> so I, I keep an eye on that every now and then. Um, but I'm not sure if it's available at a city level, so I will look into it. It's a good suggestion. What Thank you. Grumpiness. Uh, well, <laughs> you could look into that too. No, I could look into. Around this table, maybe the measures a bit <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah, I'll look into it. Thank you. We, so, we can. The mayor wants to add an amendment to be the happiest mayor of in this, the country, and we add a happiness measure. Which uh, and because I've, we've stopped wasting the most money, so that'd be good too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's more for our audit report, Mayor. Um, cool. Uh, Councillor Bartley. 
perhaps you can have a measurement between happiness level and substance use, and that might help. Um, anyway, um, my question is around, um, yeah, are they related? Um, my question is around um, how, how can we take your findings and take this report already, where you're at, and, um, you know, like, use it? In, you know, in our decision making and other organisations to use it, our CCOs. Uh, I spoke at Tataki's um, Pacific Economic Insight Series and and it seemed to be to get the city out of the funk, we got to focus on our workforce. And then I look in here and I see the educational, um, you know, the falling educational achievement and I'm wondering, are we, are we aligning here, are we, you know, with our CCOs? And then also, how do we track what we're doing to address some of these things? Will, will that be picked up? Because I see our schools going hard to um, bring families back, bring students back into the schools after COVID. Uh, but then also seeing these government changes that's going to affect education even worse. So um, in terms of addressing the equitable measures um, in, our, in our schools. So that's my question. Thank you for the question, Councillor Bartley. In terms of how we take the findings and use them, these, this is, is one set of data, obviously, which kind of needs to be combined with a whole lot of other information that comes from other sources, such as the Quality of Life Survey and the Census. Um, we make this available to staff um, and to the CCOs um, to, so that they under, get an understanding of the, the big picture and you know where they need to focus in terms of the levers that council has and the council group has um, versus other agencies. Um, so we, we, I guess we share this information and suggest it as a source for future planning and policy development. Um, how do we track what we're doing to address these things? Well, that probably happens through a lot of different programs that that are delivered, um, so we don't we don't go through and track all of the programs that contribute to um, to those outcomes, but that would happen within those individual programs. Thank you. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button, um, Councillor Newman. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, the very first bullet point you have up there in the good news column relates to housing supply and affordability. With respect to housing affordability, the only positive way that one could interpret um, that is if more people are becoming independently wealthy insofar as they can afford to buy a house. Is, it, is that how I interpret this? Because if housing affordability is, in, is measured in terms of house price, yeah, some houses might be becoming cheaper, but that means that there'll be a homeowner out there who's under mortgage stress or potentially facing foreclosure. And I don't think that that could be interpreted as good news for those people. So can you just clarify if the affordability measure there, um, because you, you note that incomes, um, you know, fell over the past year. So can I just get your understanding of how you are interpreting that in the first bullet point of the first column because it really needs to be driven by people's ability to afford because their incomes are increasing higher as opposed to, well, there's more houses on the market that basically because people can no longer afford the mortgage payments. Thank you for the question um, through the chair. This year we have replaced the housing affordability measure that we did have, um, which was actually more the kind of measure, and I can't actually right now, sitting here at the top of my head, let me look in my notes what exactly it was. But this was exactly the reason why we took it out, um, because it was hiding that kind of thing. It was the housing cost as a percentage of household income. And that, at that very broad level, actually encompasses people that have paid off their mortgages, etc. So any movements in that wasn't really telling us anything. anything. So we have replaced that measure with three new measures that looks at house price relative to um, household income um, and a rental affordability that looks at rent over income and also the housing cost over burden rate which looks at the percentage of people 
that pay more than 30% of their household income on um, housing-related costs. To get that fuller picture of what's really going on across homeowners and um, those that rent um, and um, housing stress as it's experienced by people. Um, we did try and include a mortgage affordability um, index, which is something that MHUD uses, but in the end we decided against using that because it's actually quite hard to wrap one's head around. It's a very really technical index. Um, so I think where we landed is something that gives us a, a more full picture of what is happening to housing affordability with those three sub-measures as opposed to just having one quite crude measure um, in the old monitoring framework. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> Councillor Henderson. Thank you for the second effort. It was just one question, really, because I just remembered the housing supply question I was going to ask. Uh, thank you. Um, it says here it's improving, but if you sort of go, dive into the data here, you've got a um, number of new drawings consented, and we're actually going down over the past couple of years. Um, do those things match up? What's the deal there? Thank you for the questions. Um, it does match up as far as that in the long term the picture is actually of improved housing supply compared to that 2018 baseline. Sorry. And, and more so also what we have included this year as a new measure is the number of new dwellings per thousand residents. And we're also seeing that over time that that um, measure is improving, which means it's actually controlling for population growth. And we're seeing that measure going up. So that's a good, good thing. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got a, I'm seeing that data here now, and there's a huge drop off in 2023 on the consented per thousand residents. So I'll reserve my right to speak on that, Chair. Yep. Councillor Sayers. Thank you, Chair, and th thank you for reporting your answers. Doing really well. Um, my question was just around housing affordability as well. And if you're able to, was there any data or any information that you're aware of about what actually is making the housing unaffordable compared to the other benchmarks cities that you might be looking at, i.e., is it the price of the land or is it the price of the house? Does it go down to that detail or will you provide any comment on that? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm wishing now that I'd brought our chief economist uh, with us to sit on here. Um, I'll have to come back to you on that. There is nothing in the data that we have looked at that actually looks at those particular what those drivers are. It's a complex picture of, you know, interest rates and land prices and all that. Um, but I think he'll be better equipped to answer down to that technical detail. Thank you. Yeah, I I'll get the um, <clears throat> today sometime we'll get Gary Blick's um, investigation on that done because it did show that there was a dramatic change from the unitary plan, not only housing affordability, but housing in the right place, but also housing dwellings per resident. And also, I think last year we had the highest ever percentage of first-time buyers and, and things like that. But obviously everything becomes relative, as Council Newman says. Um, but I think, it, yeah, there is a marked change since the unitary plan because of the supply. But yeah, but notwithstanding that, Housing is unaffordable for most. Um, there are any other questions? Right. Thank you both. I'll get you to uh, step back. A uh, huge amount of work there, and um, we'll see if there is any debate to be had. I know that Councillor Lee would like to speak, and then I've got Councillor Newman, Councillor Henderson. Thank you. Thank you. That. Happy to move. Councillor Filippano, would you like to second? Oh, thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the spatial plan for Auckland, as, as it was referred to in the Local Government Act, was um, a key part of the uh, local government reforms that established that led to the es establishment of the Auckland Council Super City, so called, um, and it was um, expressly a key responsibility of, of the governing body of of Auckland Council. Some cynics um, suggested that given all the important regional and local government roles had been outsourced to CCOs, it was an idea to keep the councillors busy. Um, but but nevertheless, the, the new council in 2000, and it was 
the priority of the spatial plan for Auckland um, was referred to by Prime Minister John Key at the inaugural meeting of the Auckland Council, that it was a priority. And, um, and so it was duly given priority and a lot of work went into um, what became known as the Auckland Plan uh, under Mayor Len Brown. And actually, it was well socialised uh, and uh, it was well accepted by the public. And essentially, it was a very good plan. Then, um, uh, in 2017, I think, and 18, despite the Act Section 80 of the Local Government Auckland Council Amendment Act um, indicating that the council may from time to time amend the spatial plan, the whole plan was completely rewritten um, in 2018. And some of the uh, progressive aspects in the original plan, um, a, a whole chapter devoted to the importance of built heritage, um, um, a commitment for a rail linkage to Auckland International Airport sometime in the 2020s, way ahead in the future. Um, the new plan um, removed that. Um, the, the new plan um, removed the, the chapter on the environment and um, folded it into a subset of culture, human culture. Um, the built heritage chapter was removed and so on. What I'm concerned about here is in the report, the original plan has been officially disappeared, even though it was statutory, a statutory instrument. And so in the report we have the Auckland plan was adopted in June 2018. Strictly speaking, legally speaking, an amendment to the 2012 plan was adopted in 2018, not a new plan. It can't be both ways. But anyway, um, it, in effect, legally or not, it was a new plan. Um, and the old plan has been officially disappeared, which is a pity. Meanwhile, the government, the government gave this responsibility to the Auckland Council, to the councillors, and meanwhile, it, it handpicked its own people to deal with the Auckland Unitary Plan. Just saying. Uh, okay, so now we know that the the plan and has run its statutory course and is going to be become sometime in the future a a, a spatial uh, 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 strategy. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just a little bit concerned uh, about the way we're presenting the plan is uh, that a lot of the um, good news mainly um, is not really good news at all. There, there is little detail. And as I've noted and the Mayor's noted, a lot of the, re the, the measures and the outcomes are not the Auckland Council's responsibility, but aspects of it are and aspects which are, are designated good news um, are not especially good news at all. And therefore, if we're taking God knows how much these plans cost, either the, the original one or the amendment, um, but we should be taking it, it seriously regardless now um, of, of, of the hiatus, the legal hiatus it sits, it sits within. So I... I, I um, when we talk about 39% of the measures are positive, well, you have to look at the other side of the picture, uh, essentially. Um, not so great at all. And when it comes to our own responsibilities, I think this council needs to take the measures, and the measure is the word that is used in the report, literally, and let's have a good look at what the measures are before we pronounce them to be good or not so good, rather than bad or failing. Um, thank you very much. Jordan, thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Newman. Yeah, Chair, I mean, it is a bit subjective. I asked the questions of the officers that I did because I really think that 
in relation to housing affordability, um, it's it it it's it's a matter that needs to be measured in terms of pe they are becoming more affordable to people because people are becoming wealthier, their incomes are their incomes are increasing, and that they have the ability to to service the mortgage over the life of the mortgage as opposed to well affordability is increasing because people are under mortgage stress and foreclosing the banks foreclosing etc it's a very it is a, as it is a, a subjective interpretation of good news and I'm, I'm glad that the officers provided some context for that a measure of people like this um, hands up anybody who is willing to sell their house for 25% less the market value of it in order to uh, contribute to the good news list and the Mayor's Happiness Index. And the truth is, nobody's putting up their hand to... Well, well, you can sell your house, Councillor Fear, and we'll see. Um, you know, the truth is, I don't think there will be many people, or potentially any people, who are prepared to sell their private assets for much less the market value. And the reason for that uh, is that you acquire that wealth, I think, um, in part to enjoy it and hopefully to be able to sustain yourself in the future by any, any capital gain that you might have. Um, that's my interpretation anyway. So I think, Chair, but the next speaker might have a different view, who knows. Um, Chair, the truth of the matter is, is that... Um, Building a whole lot of houses to sell to one another doesn't really add a heck of a lot to economic productivity. Um, it is the economic uh, growth that we require because of people investing in, in other assets um, that is really going to drive economic growth. And I think that there are some, there are some uh, further discussions that need to be had about that measure uh, in relation to uh, housing affordability because that is that is a very subjective matter and there are a lot of people who are waiting for the OCR to reduce further so they can enjoy the benefit of those lower interest rates because that is absolutely the measure of people's ability to to be able to manage those family budgets which have been under pressure for some years now. Thanks. Sure, thank you, Councillor Newman. Councillor Henderson. Yeah, thanks. Just a couple of quick things. Thank you, Chair. Look, just um, thanks to the staff. I mean, the data is great, and my annoying questions were answered extremely well. So <laughs> thank you so much for all that. Um, I think it's a really useful report. Um, but like previous speakers, um, although I take different views on conclusions, I think um, we cannot look at the report as a complete picture. I just want to um, firstly remind colleagues around the State of the City report, which is this really good international baseline on how Auckland's performing internationally, and, and um, I'd recommend a read if you haven't read it already, go through that stuff, that's really good. Um, the other thing is that it kind of obscures things a little bit, because we've got a 2018 kind of baseline data issue here, when if you go through and look at the actual graphs in this report, and I know we all have, you're seeing huge declines in quality of life across the board over the last 12 months, right? You're seeing hell of a lot less houses being consented, you're seeing um, costs going up, you're seeing unemployment going up, you're seeing people really struggling, right? Um, this is the kind of stuff that we've got to be thinking about when we're exercising our roles. Um, Construction sector, I've got mates in the construction sector, it's never looked this bad in a very long time, people being laid off left and right. Um, when you go and delve into that data, the picture that you find though, is that supply for housing has a huge bearing on house price increases and rent increases. The more we encourage supply, the good stuff happens. People pay less for those houses, it's simple supply and demand, it's simple economics you'd learn in school. Um, there are some, who advocate to dampen supply, either directly or indirectly, saying either we don't need it, or we don't need it here, or we don't need it there, right? I would point those people firstly to the Public Housing Register, which is huge and hasn't been touched since 2020. Sort of dances around a bit, but it's ex extremely high um, and unacceptable for a city to, to accept that level of poverty that we have. Um, you know, there are people out there that, that, like I said, want to dampen that supply, and I suspect that, so for some of them at least, they have their house. I'm all right, Jack. 
doesn't matter. It doesn't matter about house prices for new people trying to get into the market and start their homes. Um, so these are the people that I think we should be advocating for at this table. Um, but that supply, it's got to be built in the right place too. And the other thing that we've learned from this report is that you're seeing congestion get worse because the unitary plan has been operating this time. Uh, a lot of people celebrate that. I, I think it didn't go far enough. And we have, through that time, built a donut city where the opportunities for work and the opportunities for study remain far away from where the new housing is built, and that creates congestion, and it creates emissions, and it creates all kinds of issues. Um, the other thing I'd just caution us on quickly on an entirely new tangent is um, unemployment. So unemployment data and inequality data. These things, I mean, this stuff doesn't fall evenly across a population, right? And I don't need to tell you guys this, but, you know, looking at the GFC, uh, the data coming out of that was really interesting, where the big end of town largely stayed okay, right? And things were good. And we've, since that time, uh, that was distracting, but um, 15 years on, we've got a national myth that New Zealand survived through it really well and it was great economic management and all this kind of stuff, right? Well, it wasn't great economic management in lower socioeconomic areas, which were suffering double digit unemployment. You know, that's what we saw. And that's what the data is showing we're heading towards again. So we've got to really double down and, and do what we can to encourage economic growth um, across the places that we really need to encourage it in. So that's it, just a bit of a rant and a lecture, but I hope there was something useful in there, Chair. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Philippine. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, the information contained in this report is what it is. You know, I mean, we've looked at it. It's been reported back to us. The issue for me is the census that has been reported now and delivered to us. I want to, and this is through you, Chair, I was going to put an amendment up. I'm not going to do that. But I think that we need to have a look at that, report, that the census and just to really update the information that we have based not only on that but any other further information. I will leave that with you, Chair, because, again, the information, and, and as we've, we've heard, is, is something that's out there with a lot of other reports. We also, if you have a look at the agenda, on number three, we, we have our, uh, the Future Development Strategy Monitoring Report coming to us, and that's coming to us at the end of this year. So, Chair, that's, that's just my plea to you as Chair and, and, your, and Councillor Dalton as Deputy Chair, just to sort of have a look, see what can be done with the, uh, the, the new census data that we have. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Turner. Thank you. And, and on the back of uh, Councillor Filippino's comments, I understand this is a report and the data is the data, and uh, data can always be sliced and diced. But I, I just want to say that I have had no observation over my lifetime that houses have got cheaper in any way by simple supply and demand. And the other thing I just wanted to ask, well, it's not a question, I just wanted to obs make the observation that we're in the process of buying out 700 to 900 homes um, and the end result of that calculation could have an effect on on the prices um, of, of that we're talking here. So all I'm really trying to highlight is the number of variables that are happening on the ground that we don't necessarily uh, lock into when we uh, make these sorts of um, reports and debates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ferry. Uh, kia ora. I wasn't going to speak to this item, but seeing as we're talking about housing, um, I think one of the things that um, really concerns me is the way that we do seem to be creating an Auckland a housing market where if you want to buy, um, it's kind of like I've seen it described as a Bridgerton economy. You sort of need to inherit wealth or marry into it. Um, and for myself, uh, I was lucky to inherit enough for a deposit. Uh, I have friends who did not and have had to buy outside of Auckland. Um, I've mentioned before, it means our children are not growing up together, which um, you know, I, I personally uh, mourn to a certain extent because uh, they're not having those close relationships and, and we're, we're losing connection. 
Uh, so there's also a real lack of mobility for people who might move out of Auckland to get a first house and then are completely shut out in terms of if they need to return later in life as well. Um, yeah, the, the difference in um, how much you'll get for a house in, say, Christchurch, there's no way you can move back to Auckland unless you are significantly downsizing. Um, and that is just shutting people out from potentially moving back to support networks, moving to work, education opportunities as well. But then there's the other side of the market too. There's rentals. And um, I'm really worried about the large number of kind of order um, developments that are paused, particularly in my area. I live in one of those neighbourhoods. We have had um, dozens of houses taken out, no sign of construction of new housing whatsoever. Some really good plans for some intensification, quite modest intensification actually, but the construction is actually not happening. Um, so the slowdown for the construction industry at that end of the market is going to start to really show up in a lot of these figures um, when we're looking at the annual report next year, I think. Um, and it really hollows out those communities too. You know, it has an on, it has an impact on um, local schools, um, local scout group. <laughs> you know, we've, we're seeing a drop in numbers for the scout group. Um, all of those kinds of civic institutions that provide connection within a neighbourhood. Um, it increases illegal dumping because there's a whole lot of vacant sites and, and you know we've got a lot of damage to our roads that isn't, aren't getting fixed because um, there's still a lot of trucks moving around and there's going to be for a while yet, so why fix a pothole? It'll just be back next week. Um, I'm having some success getting some of those potholes temporarily patched, so shout out to AT for that. Um, but you know this kind of stuff really worries me because the amount of social housing we have available has that impact on the public housing register and also impacts on um, rents in the private sector, many of which are becoming um, impractical, particularly in the way that Councillor Henderson talks about those opportunities that are closer to transport links, to um, you know, that, that area, a lot of area um, which I represent around uh, the west of the Isthmus um, and the south of the Isthmus, where you know the trans we are pushing people further out with higher transport costs, so uh, which also means often higher emissions. And finally, I just wanted to address the issue that um, Councillor Turner raised about the the cost of housing not decreasing over um, over his uh, decades. I don't say decades pejoratively. I have some decades too. Um, what we're seeing is yes, the the Dollar, the price tag hasn't hasn't decreased. Um, my parents paid thirty five thousand dollars for um, a house in Glenfield, uh, not on a full quarter acre section in the seventies. They sold it. Well, Mum sold it for one and a half million um, about three years ago. So yeah, that price didn't go down. What hasn't kept up though with those increases in, in housing costs, be that buying or renting, is incomes. Incomes have not kept up. So while we may have had inflation um, in house prices that have seen house prices go up significantly, a lot of people don't have the kind of income relativity that they used to have. It used to be, for example, um, in the 70s, that um, the average, the, the wage of a, a teacher was generally about the same as a backbench MP. Um, now it's nowhere near that level. Um, and so we have a lot of people in jobs where they are just not getting paid at the level of income um, that they can access housing. And that's that's a big significant change as well as those increase in transport costs. So I did just want to give some broader context to the to the increase in, in the cost of housing. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Ferry. And just quickly from me, uh, Councillor Filipina, we will work with staff to um, look at what we can do with the census data. Obviously, this is a June to July or July to June um, monitoring report, so can't include those census data pieces. And once again, there there isn't a way when the legislation had changed mid last year that we could have done a Auckland plan refresh this year. That the amount of it's millions of dollars actually, and and huge amount of time to do these refreshes. So so we just need to have clear guidance from the new government about what they're going to do. Because if we have to do a full spatial plan refresh after spending a couple million dollars on it this year, then I don't think that's a good use of our staff time, uh, sadly. But it does put it back into the Mayor's Court 
you know, when we are being told uh, no more nice to haves and no more things, we just need governments of all shades to know how these sweeping decisions can affect us and what we need to spend and the time delays it puts on us focusing investment on our communities. Um, to Councillor Lee's point, where the investment, trying to fix some of these issues ourselves, we do see, um, if you see the census data from 2023, the big green bits where people are cycling is where our infrastructure is. People are cycling where we've put safe infrastructure in, in uh, where we've started rolling out the targeted rate and the frequent, the 40 frequent routes, we're seeing now people living closer to um, public transport than ever before. That's shown up in this data. Uh, the data around our biodiversity and the Hauraki Gulf Islands and the, the money we're putting in there through the natural environment targeted rate. These are things we can do under our responsibility, but we do expect the government to work with us on some of those harder to reach um, systems around child poverty, around housing. The mayor was at a homelessness um, event this morning speaking about how we're doing our bit, but we need um, the government and other organisations to, to help us with that. So this is just a monitoring report yearly. It, it does bring up all these questions because the data doesn't show um, all those nuances and the stories from our communities, but it is important that we are measuring it anyway to help make decisions. All those in favour? Any opposed? No? And perfectly to one o'clock, we'll go for a half an hour uh, lunch and then we'll be back for the last two or three items. Um, cool. Thank you.